Thanks so much, Keith. Yep, Debbie and Adam here for the next right thing on this Tuesday. And Adam, we're still at the beginning of June, which is dedicated to the Sacred Heart. And last weekend on the Spirit World, we had an amazing show. We're still getting the feedback from um, the show on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. And coming up this Friday, we just want to remind our listeners, this is a great opportunity for those that want to take on the devotion of the First Fridays, the nine consecutive First Fridays and the promise that are attached to this devotion. And I just thought we'd go over a, a couple things again for our Morning Joy listeners just to, you know, see if it's something that interests them and, and they want to go deep with our Lord and the intimacy of his heart, heart to heart. I love that. It's just incredible. And we, we're learning a lot of things as, as we journey along together as Morning Joy listeners. So why don't you um, share what's on, what's on your mind and heart, and uh, I will do the same. And hopefully maybe we'll get it's a few more folks interested in the First Friday devotions. Oh, absolutely. Um, so for those of you that don't know, super briefly, uh, there was a devotion to the five wounds of Jesus starting in the 11th century, really early in the church. In the 1673 to 75, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque received some visitations from Jesus, and um, he told her to promote devotion to his sacred heart and gave her a number of promises associated with that. Her spiritual director, uh, a Jesuit, St. Claude La Colombiere, brought that out to the world because she was cloistered. Uh, it was made a basically a universal feast in the church in 1856. In 1871, the Jesuits took on the Sacred Heart as kind of the center of their spirituality. And then we saw the canonization of St. Margaret Mary and St. Claude in 1920 and then 1922, respectively. And um, the devotion has grown, uh, particularly since John Paul II has been promoting it. I think, you know, some of the exciting things um, that come with a devotion, of course, we don't do things to get things out of God. We do things to hopefully make God pleased with, pleased with us. But here's some of the promises that Jesus gave to Margaret Mary to tell us about. I think it's worth taking a moment to read those because it's going to encourage you to get that First Friday devotion going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will give them all graces necessary in their state of life, the kind of the life he's called you to. I will establish peace in their homes. I will comfort them in all their afflictions. I will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. I will bestow abundant blessings upon all their undertakings. Sinners will find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy lukewarm souls shall be f become fervent fervent souls shall quickly mount to high perfection i will bless every place in which an image of my heart is exposed and honored i will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened of hearts those who promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart and finally i promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive holy communion on the first fridays in nine consecutive months, the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving their sacraments. Okay? My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. Wow. So this is a great time to start the First Friday devotion. You can do it in, in other consecutive months, but this would be a perfect, uh, you know, a perfect time um, to do that. Mm -hmm. You can start the First Friday of any month, um, yeah, so if you if if that's the, if this is the time for you, that's great. But don't feel bad; you can start it next month. Yeah, well, and this Friday is the feast of the Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. so you'll always remember when you started this devotion and the promises that are attached. And you know, Adam ran down the twelve promises, but you know, one of the things that really caught my eye um, when I initially looked into this devotion when I was younger, Adam, was this idea of uh, going back to um, peace in your home. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, I will establish peace in their homes. The interesting thing about that, Adam, is when I was growing up, there was a lot of tension in our home. And, and I, didn't, I didn't care for that at all. And I, I, my mother had a strong devotion to the Sacred Heart, so much so that she put a huge image of the Sacred Heart in, in our hallway. In fact, we saw it every time we came in our front door and had to go down the hallway to our bedrooms. The Sacred Heart image was there, and it almost seemed like it followed us, you know, down the hallway. And so we always, it was very prominent in our home. 
And, and I, I do credit the devotion to the Sacred Heart for keeping a sense of calm and peace in, in, in our personal lives, uh, who, everyone who lived in, in, in my home when I was growing up in New Jersey. And I do believe in these promises because I've seen, I've seen it in my own life and I've seen it in, in the lives of others, especially some priests that have a strong devotion to the Sacred Heart. You're talking some pretty miraculous things happen on a regular basis when you are tied to Jesus's heart. Well, we know from the Eucharist and Eucharistic miracles that it is the heart muscle when there's a miracle. Miracle. It's a heart muscle. So this is very important to Jesus. And, and he wants all of us. He, wa- he loves us so very much, but he wants us to love him, right? And how, where do we feel that love in the heart to heart connection? And, and it's so, it, it, to me, I, I just, I love this devotion. And to think that St. Margaret Mary Alacoque was able to rest her head on his heart and Jesus's heart. Wow. I mean, when I think about that, I mean, what, what an incredible young nun um, she was um, to be able to have. And by the way, she had these um, encounters with Jesus and Mary as a small child. In fact, she thought everybody talked to Jesus and Mary, similar to what Padre Pio said and a lot of other saints. And, you know, she was part of the Visitation Sisters. That, that was her cloistered order. And, you know, that comes from St. Francis de Sales. And I don't know if you made the connection there. So, I mean, there's all these connecting of the dots that I just love. And I, I love St. Francis de Sales because um, Jerry Usher got me really uh, close to his teachings. And the thing that I live by is when he said that God commands us to pray, but forbids us to worry. Mm, wow. I know. Isn't that amazing? That was a game. That was another game changer for me. Maybe we could do a whole nother, the next right thing on that, because that, that really helped me to move past some of the fear and anxiety of things because, you know, that God is not there, you know, God doesn't know fear. Right. And so it's important for us to stay in prayer and uh, he forbids us to worry, but that's a separate uh, next right thing. But for this sacred heart, I just want to encourage listeners, please think about this. If you can make time this Friday uh, go to your first mass, your first one of nine, so that you can enter deeply into this devotion and get that prominent image in your home of the Sacred Heart, the Immaculate Heart of Mary as well, the Twin Hearts, and um, and trust your home and everybody who lives there uh, to the, to the Twin Hearts, and you won't be disappointed, right, Adam? Yeah, and. For those that don't know, there's an enthronement prayer, a prayer that can be said by anybody in the home. It doesn't have to be your priest. When you put these images up, you kind of give the home over to Jesus and Mary. If you're doing the twin hearts of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, there's an enthronement. And so when you were growing up, your mother had it there in a prominent position. Why is it in a prominent position? Just like you said, that was a beautiful example. We came home. We walked in and that's what we see. Mm -hmm. It's like it's a reminder for us about our walk with Jesus and that the home should be a place that he is present, you know, in all of our discussions and all of our times, the good times and the bad, the difficulties, the great times in the family that Jesus is present and over and inspiring those things. Mm -hmm. There's another one, Deb, that struck me. Uh, with the promises. So number six, sinners will find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. That sounds an awful like, uh, awful lot like divine mercy and the <laughs> yep. messages Faustina received. You got and, it. And she received them all those years later. And it's almost like, uh, and we, we were discussing this before and you pointed mm-hmm. this out, you're great at connecting the dots. It's almost like we didn't fully embrace this devotion as much as he wished, or maybe understood it as deeply as he wished. And so he expanded on that promise right. with Faustina and said, let me explain to you this ocean of mercy that, I, that I'm that i offering you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, you nailed it, Adam. You know that I'm a, I'm a history buff and I love church history. And if you do, like you said, connect all the pieces, it's fascinating. You, you look at... Um, uh, John Paul II being active in promoting divine mercy, right? And, and then him, him promoting the sacred heart, uh, canonizing, um, uh, St. Claude, uh, who was the spiritual director of St. Margaret Mary, um, 
you know, and so the, the all the connection there. I think John Paul too, obviously must have must have uh, uh, knew what we're saying as well, because that's why he took such great uh, time and effort to promote uh, the Sacred Heart and the ocean of mercy and and love that comes uh, that pours forth from Jesus's heart. Because if you go all the way back to the 1600s, Saint Margaret Mary, you're right, and maybe we didn't we didn't take it seriously enough. So then here comes Saint Faustina. So now now we're starting to pay attention. This is the time and this is the month, Adam. June is the month for us to really take this seriously. So I love this. I, I, I think it's fascinating and I think now more than ever, we do need to feel Jesus's love and, and mercy because we're in a world that is very cold, very distant and gets people to fall to despair very easily. And that's dangerous. So we need this devotion, I think, now more than ever. What do you say? No, I agree. Um, this devotion really is about bringing blessings into our lives, blessings into the the state in life that we're in, you know, the, the place that Jesus has put us, his plan for us to bring blessing and peace to that. Um, as opposed to today, you know, it, it's so easy to fall into worry and anxiety and, and the way social media amplifies the negative and, you know, downplays the positive. Um, and the young people coming up, I think they've got a lot of anxiety. That's what I see in a lot of news stories with, with social media and the way the world works now. The idea of peace in the home, the idea of the soul becoming fervent, uh, the blessings on work, the blessings on the home, just by the enthronement of that picture, he himself promises to bless the home. Yeah. You know, bringing this into a world filled with anxiety and fear um, I, I agree. I think this is a great time for this devotion. So, Adam, we had a caller on Saturday for the Spirit World who called in and shared a very um, deep mystical encounter that she experienced during Mass, and other parishioners saw it as well. And then after the show, we, we talked, uh, you know, with the show team, and we were sharing some some other things that we witnessed in, in ministry. And you know, there's there's a need to keep a lot of these things very private because you don't want to just open up everything and say, okay, I had an encounter. You know, we saw Jesus here or we saw Mary here. And, you know, and then you got the church running around like crazy trying to figure out what's authentic and what's not. Um, but a lot of these, um, um, you know, really beautiful um uh, manifestations happen uh, as gifts to all of us, right? But they're really meant to sometimes just privately for us and, and where we're at. So I, I, I thought it would be interesting for this last segment of The Next Right Thing to tie into the Sacred Heart. You know, maybe you could share what you've experienced in ministry. I, for the many years that I've been at the parish level, I, I used to see it all the time, but, I, but it was interesting. The pastor shared with me a couple things that he said were key to having these mystical encounters. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have encountered over the years um, certain parishes or priests, sometimes it's the priest, but more often it's the parish, where these type of things happen on a more regular basis. And it's not just a, one individual maybe, you know, having some imagination or, or something like that. It's These are things that everybody is seeing and experiencing and corroborating. Um, those have been often very faithful priests, truly believing, deeply believing priests, <laughs> and places where benediction and adoration is going on. Um, when I have received emails from people, I, I received one where a person had taken a photograph when the monstrance was elevated during benediction, and there was a kind of a circling bright what looked like fire uh, spiraling out from it. Right. And they said that they took the picture because normally you don't take pictures in church. They took it because they saw this fire of love emanating from the Eucharist and other people also took pictures and saw it with their, with their eyes. Um, these, these, as you said, are gifts. <laughs> They're usually for the individual. Um, because, as you said, the church is cautious about allowing the kind of public promulgation of messages. It's one thing if somebody has a personal experience, like I just shared something somebody shared with me, that was just their personal experience. We're not saying that, you know, 
a miracle happened at this particular church and you need to listen to this message. The church is real careful about those things because imagination can play a role um, for a lot of people. And, and it's rare that these things are genuine. And so the church is cautious about bringing them forward. But the other thing, Deb, I think these things are happening in a small way for individuals all the time on a regular basis. And they're not meant to be promulgated to the world and people don't necessarily feel moved to share them, but it's a gift for their own spirituality, their own particular journey. Um, and with spiritual maturity, I think comes less, comes kind of um, being settled with these kind of experiences and not feeling a need to get attention for them or uh, promote them or tell people about them. Right. I would agree with you. And if you look at Eucharistic miracles, the ones that have been documented and um, they're authentic by the Catholic Church, oftentimes um, God showed himself for the for the um, the parishioners or for the people uh, or for the uh, priest himself, if there was any type of doubt or anything that was going on. So God would show himself in these Eucharistic miracles and, and to restore faith, to en to enhance the faith to deepen and strengthen the faith of the people. And that's important because remember miracles happen for that individual person and for the people around them as well. Um, and, and so a lot of times when people have a mystical encounter, a private mystical encounter, there's, a, a, um, sometimes people will say, well, you know, what was going on? Were they having a crisis of faith or something? And that's why God had to show himself. That's not true. Um, there was a, there's a wonderful uh, pastor that I worked for, a very holy, holy priest. He has gone on to meet the Lord. Um, he served, he served his uh, beautiful time here on earth. He was very close to St. Therese, uh, the little flower. And um, he used to say to us all the time um, as a staff, he would say, you know, it's interesting. You'll find that the priests that are that are Marian priests, very close to the Blessed Mother, that are very deep um, spiritually, spend a lot of time in adoration, a lot of time in prayer, that are very, that are kind of wa that are walking the walk, talking the talk. You'll see mystical encounters just happen. They, it's kind of like heaven follows them, right? Mm -hmm. And it and it oh Adam, it was so true. I worked six years at this parish, almost on a daily basis, Adam. There were the things that would happen, like flowers and petals becoming from heaven, you know, and we knew that was St. Therese, you know, had a message for, for this particular priest. I mean, it would just happen or, or people would go into the uh, perpetual adoration chapel and they would say, you know, they saw the face of Jesus and they would, and they would come back to the, to the uh, pastor and they would say, father, I, I think I just saw the face of Jesus. And he'd go, mm -hmm, yeah, like it was like, mm -hmm. it was just natural. And, and I just believe that holiness brings more holiness to everybody around, you know, in the parish community. And so, um, yeah, these, these things, I, I think it's, it's, they're so beautiful and it just, it's God's loving touch of connecting with us. You know, he, he'll never infringe on our free will. So he wants us to fully love him with all of our mind, heart, soul, right? And, but he's not, but he wants to connect so badly. You know, it's almost like he bursts through just to say, do you, do you see that I'm here? You know, I love that about our God. What do you say to that before we send it back to Keith? Well, I would just remind everybody, if you want to pursue, you know, we don't pursue God for miracles. We don't, shouldn't pursue miracles. But if you want to pursue that kind of deep spirituality Deb is talking about, here's a great opportunity. Start your First Friday devotion, meaning go to Mass and receive communion, nine consecutive First Fridays of the month. Do the enthronement of the Immaculate and Sacred Heart in your home. You don't need your priest to do that. Anybody in the home can do that. Maybe pray the Novena to the Sacred Heart. And I would really encourage you to find and print off from a legitimate source. We did post them on our social media when we did our full show at the Spirit World on this, the Litany of the Sacred Heart, and pray it slowly and meditate on, on what it's opening to you because I, I find that very moving and it gives you a feel for how Jesus feels about you. So pursue the promises, pursue the graces, um, do it to please Jesus and what's going to please him is you moving towards him and moving towards his love and mercy. Amen to that. That'll do it for the next right thing. And we're going to send it back for comments and for the rest of Morning Joy um, by our wonderful host who's leading the way, Keith Downey.